change your heart, change your life, change the planet. Hey everybody, it's Tim Van Orden, and today I wanna to talk about Maps of Meaning. Not the book by Jordan Peterson, but how we are innate map makers, that that's what we do all day long and throughout our lives. We make maps. And these maps can either lead us to great happiness and success, or these maps can lead us toward despair and depression and failure. So I'm gonna to focus today on maps of meaning related to depression. We don't actually experience the world as it is. We experience a mapped version that we have created. And it's got many, many layers. Just like the world outside, when turned into a map that you look at on your phone or in a book, you're gonna to see topographical information, where the land rises and falls, where the river valleys are. You're gonna see perhaps where political boundaries are between countries and states and towns. You might see streets, large thoroughfares, for instance, interstates or US highways. You may see gas stations. You may see supermarkets, like where can I find the nearest Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. You may also find information about traffic patterns on particular streets. You may find weather maps showing the radar of where the storms are as they move across the map. There's so many different layers of data that can be represented on a map. And our brains are constantly doing this with the world that we actually see and interact with. And throughout our lives, we are adding layers of meaning to these maps so that the older we get, the more layers of information exist on that map. So the maps become heavier in a sense. It's not as easy to move through them. And if you've ever seen teenagers date versus people in their 50s try to date, you'll notice that the teenagers don't really have a lot of criteria yet for who they want to interact with romantically. It may just be somebody looked at me and that was it. But by the time you get to be my age, there are many layers or dimensions of personality, character, biology, whatever you want to call it, that the person has to pass through before they make it into my, hmm, dateable. <laughs> and we do this with everything in life. So how this applies to depression is that depression is a really accurate map about certain aspects of existence or culture. Depression is not a delusional state so much as it's a really, really honest assessment and mapping of things that are not so good. For most people, something negative may happen and it just washes over them and it doesn't end up in the map. But if somebody has a tendency for depression, anytime something negative happens, it gets added to the map. It gets circled, it gets X'd, and it gets carved in there so that you never forget it. And this causes us to become stuck. We look out at the world that we have mapped and we see danger, we see threat, and it's accurate because it did happen there, 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 or with these people. So we're not looking at a delusional map. We're looking at a map that's very accurate. But the things that happen to us or in the world are stickier than they would be for the average person. So the first step in healing depression is to realize that you live in this layered mapped existence of the world and that your map has lots of accurate negative information on it. So that when you look at yourselves through that map or when you look at the map of you, because your personality is also a map, and when you look at the outer map of the world, you don't see a lot of possibility. You don't see a lot of good. In fact, you may not see any and your brain is going to habitually go down the streets that don't look all that pleasant. So what you have to do, number one, is to develop the awareness that this mapping is occurring and that what you're seeing is not the world or even you, but a map, a multi-layered map with all kinds of information, much of it negative. And yeah, it's accurate, but it's not the world and it's not you. They're simply things that happened and they happened in the past, but they got really strongly etched into the map. So number one, wake up to the fact that this is a map. This is a map. My self-concept, my self-esteem, it's a map. 
It's not true. It's not representative of who or what I actually am. Nor is my map of the world representative of what it is right now in this moment. It might represent what happened in one moment at one time and then in another moment at another time, but it doesn't represent the world as it is right now. So you'll hear people talk about depressive realism, that in studies it's been shown that depressed people generally are more accurate in their assessments of the world and of themselves. And that is true to a degree, but only if you have an ongoing narrative and your identity and the world around you is a coherent story that you and others tell. If people in your environment keep saying that you are a certain kind of person, then that's going to be part of the larger cultural narrative that you exist inside of. So you're constantly reminded of who you are when you're around these people because their story includes you and your story includes them. So again, number one, realize this is just a map and the map is not the territory. It's a representation of the territory. And it's a useful representation. It allows our brain to quickly and easily make decisions and to move forward without a lot of effort. But if your map is full of danger and negativity and threat, you're not going to want to move at all. You're not going to want to leave the house. You're not going to want to get out of bed because the map you're looking at says thunderstorms and violent crime and terrorist attack and people rejecting me and whatever else that you have mapped in your life. So once you develop the awareness that what's going on out there is just a map and what you're feeling and seeing and hearing in here is also just a map, you can step aside and observe the fact that your brain is mapping. It's telling you a story. It's painting the world. It's painting a picture of your day. It's getting out your atlas and saying, oh, this is what my day is going to look like and feel like. This is the geography of me in my world. But it's not true. And sometimes negative things do actually happen, like the giant storm that just hit my studio. I don't know if you can hear the thunder there or the rain hitting the building. So negative things do happen and they are real. But just because it's stormy right now doesn't mean that it's always going to be stormy. This is something that's happening right here and right now, but it's not universal and it's not permanent. And this is what happens when you create a map. You put permanent indelible ink on there and say it's always like this in this spot. But that's not the way the world is. So we develop the awareness. We get next to it and observe that it's happening. And then three, we allow for the world to be as it is. We practice the three most important words in the English language, at least to me. I don't know. How is the world? I don't know. Is it going to rain today? I don't know. Am I able to take this step? I don't know. Let's find out. But when we're stuck in the map, we don't find out. We find doubt. Because when we open up the map and we say, well, what's going to happen in this spot at this time if I take that step? And I look and it's like, oh God, on the map, that, that's a no-no. So we developed doubts. We're like, I don't think I can do it because I'm looking at the map and it doesn't look good. There's too much traffic right there right now. So no, I can't take that step. So we find reasons to doubt our ability. We find reasons to doubt the world. We find reasons to doubt others. So when we work from that map, we find doubt. When we let the map go and we allow the world to show up as it is, uncertain, unpredictable, and full of possibility, good and bad, well, then we can take a step and find out. Maybe that map needs to be updated. Maybe that map is not accurate. In fact, it's not maybe, it's definitely not accurate because everything is in a process of change. Everything is moving, including you. The map of you is not accurate and the map of the world is not accurate because they're stuck in time. So we've got to allow for this moment to show up outside of how we've mapped it. And that's not easy, but with practice, you can do it. 
So whenever you hear yourself spinning, you're telling yourself stories, you're lying in bed, you're ruminating, you're talking to yourself, you're talking about the day, you're talking about how you feel, you're thinking about the phone call that you can't make or the thing that you can't write or the, the person that you can't go see. Whatever the story is, it's just a map out there and in here. You've got to tease off the layers one by one until you're left with the terrain. And that takes time. It takes practice. But if you start with the understanding that what you experience is stuck in time, it's stuck on a map. And just like opening up an old atlas from the 1960s, you're going to see that there are a lot fewer roads and cities and towns are generally much smaller on that map. And they keep getting updated you're rarely going to find a map that has less information on it as time goes by. And we're the same way. We had more and more layers to the world out there and we had more and more layers to ourselves. So as we get older, it becomes harder and harder to tease away these extra layers or peel back the layers or the skins of the onion until we get down to the heart of the matter, which is, I don't know. Uncertainty is the truth. When you peel away everything, all you're left with is, I don't know. And therefore, I can't be certain that it's going to go poorly. I can't be certain that I'm not going to succeed. When you don't know, there is possibility. But when you're looking at that map and it's so well defined, you've limited your possibility to the point in depression where there is no room for movement because everywhere you look and feel on the maps that you've created is danger, threat, or inadequacy. And I'm not telling you that depression is bad, but the way to live with depression is to take the body that is experiencing this depression and separate it from the identity that has mapped you and the world around you and let your body take steps. Let your being move in the world. It knows what to do. It knows how to walk. It knows how to move. It knows how to engage. It knows how to relate. But it gets stuck and challenged when our maps try to take over. It's like a backseat driver. And I've got someone who's pretty close to me. I won't mention names, but I drive them around on a regular basis. And they'll often tell me that I can't go down certain roads. And it's like, why not? Because I don't like that road. But I'm perfectly capable of getting you to your destination safely in one piece and faster than if I were to take the road that you want me to take because on your map, that road is safer. And the road that I want to take, you have mapped as dangerous, bad, avoid. So just like our identities cannot see the capabilities of our body, of our being, a backseat driver cannot see or trust the capabilities of the person driving the car. They don't trust. And when you are depressed, your mapper, your inner cartographer, does not trust the rest of you. So this is something that I do on a daily basis. I wake up, I hear it, I feel it, and it's like, ah, that's just the map. Let's tease off the layers one by one until I'm out of bed, in my clothes, and out in the world allowing the world to show up, allowing my workouts to show up, allowing myself to not know what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go, or what's going to happen when I get there. And it's amazing how I take that start and turn it into something extraordinary every day. And you can do the same thing. So those are my thoughts on inner cartography. Let me know in the comments below what you think or what your experiences have been. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like my channel, subscribe and click the bell to make sure that you get the updates. And if you want to keep this channel healthy, come on over to Patreon. For a buck or two a month, you keep me in this conversation. I am so grateful for all your support. Thanks. All right, I'll see you.